So um, I just want to introduce you to Miranda Murray and Jordan Forster. Um, they are with Indian Education for All here in Great Falls um, for the Great Falls Public Schools. And they are also with Bright Trail Education. And they have come up with a wonderful program for you guys tonight. So enjoy. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Um, like Melissa said, my name is Miranda Murray and I am a uh, Yankton Sioux descendant of the Fort Peck tribe here in Montana. I'm currently an Indian Ed for All instructional coach and we co-own and co-facilitate presentations for Bright Trail Education. Um, I previously was an art educator for our district with an emphasis in art history and art criticism. My name is Jordan Forrester. My Aani uh, name or Grovant name is Bright Trail Woman. I work alongside with Miranda in the Indian edu Education Department, and as she said, we co-own a business together called Bright Trail Education, where we travel around, we help other educators across the state implement Indian education in their classroom and in their content, and we are very excited to be here and see your faces. I was getting a little nervous. I didn't realize there was like a checkpoint where you like, everyone checks in, <laughs> because it was like 5.46, and I don't mean this in a way that like, hurry up, but I was like, there was nobody out here. And we were like, okay. <laughs> and then It'll we heard okay. voices and I was like, oh good. I was good. like, I know there'll be one People. person because I knew my mom People. was coming. <laughs> so we'd be fine. We'd be fine. We knew there would at least be one. <laughs> Um, I do want to preface by saying that as educators, we're not very good at speaking at people. So this will hopefully be a more conversational evening for you. Feel free to ask questions. Um, if you're not the type of person to ask questions in front of the group, there will be time at the end of our presentation um, after our gallery walk to ask additional questions with us uh, before you leave. Yeah, and so this presentation will be half hour-ish. And then we're gonna go visit Andy Warhol first, Billy Shank, and then we're gonna go downstairs and visit Frank Buffalo Hyde. Uh, we're gonna leave some time also at the end. If, if you felt like we didn't give you enough time to look at all of the things, feel free to walk around, but we'll be around as well if you have additional questions or you wanna continue the conversation with us. So, hi, welcome. More people! Yay, hey, come on in. No, you're more totally people. Fine. No, we're very excited. Happy to have, oh, more, we love come it. on in. We love it. This is fantastic. So as we begin, I want you, and don't be afraid, we're not going to call on people and have them share out. I want you to begin, as we start our presentation, thinking about the images that come to mind when you hear the phrase Native American. When you hear the phrase Native American, what imagery pops into your head? Oftentimes, it's something like this. So these images are the first images that pop up when I Google searched the phrase Native American. And I mean, they're great, they're beautiful images, but what do we notice about them? Because these images, when you Google search other racial groups, so black Americans, white Americans, Hispanic Americans, different images pop up, but a commonality of these photos that's different than other racial groups is that most of them are historical, right? We know this because they're in black and white. And the consequence to that, if you aren't lucky enough to live in a place like Montana where we have 12 sovereign nations, if you live in some other state, and you wanted to just find out more information about Native Americans and you Google searched this, especially if you're a student and we get this all of the time, you might think something like, well, they're not around anymore, right? Because, these, because I'm a, I'm, when we're thinking about students and their frame of reference, they know that old pictures means black and white or some makeup of this, right? And this doesn't happen with any other racial group in the United States. So, also, a consequence of that too is that they are very similar in that they're wearing a lot of the same things. So to be Native American, you have to have on feathers or you have to have long hair, you have to have the braids. There's um, teepees featured in a couple of these photos. So that's, that's 
what our children are exposed to, and unfortunately, that's what adults are exposed to, too, this imagery. And what we're going to talk to you about tonight is how all three of these artists that we're featuring really started to challenge that. They did a really good job of questioning what's popular, how do you become popular, how do you become a hero, how do you become a villain, and really challenging this mystified idea, this romanticism of what we know as the Wild West. So um, once Western expansion really began to take off, so did the marketing of things called dime novels. So we have Buffalo Bills, this um, over here the, on this far side, it's called Buffalo Bills Special Service, The Death Dance of the Apaches. And similar books are mass produced and distributed across the United States with this Western expansion. Most of these authors with the dime novels had never been out West, right? They started reading their own dime novels or different dime novels and they started thinking, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, right? And from what I know about books, the more exciting, the more thrilling they are, the better they sell, right? No one wants to read a book that says, well, we moved out west and everyone got along and it was fine, right? Yeah, not very exciting. So the problem with that too is that it created these really romanticized visions of what the west was, but also that was the beginning of establishing who were the heroes, right? And I don't, wanna, I don't mean it in a way that patriotism is bad, it's not at all. But anytime you have a hero, you have to have a villain. And there's real consequences to that. The imagery and these ideas of who were the bad people at the time really gave rise through these dime novels as they were distributed in mass quantities across the United States. It also makes me think of like when we were kids and you, we were all part of games of cowboys and Indians and the kids that, you know, there was many a times the kids understood who's the hero and who's the bad guy, right? Because the heroes wanted to be the cowboys and the bad guys often played by the native people. Absolutely. Um, romanticized in a bunch of different ways and Billy Shank does a really good job of questioning this too the rise of a hero, because what we know about the original cowboys now is that the majority of them weren't white. The majority of cowboys at the time during the cattle run were black and Hispanic, right? This romanticized idea of our history. But also, when you're only exposed to things like this, and our students, our children, or whoever are only exposed to images like that, you really create a scaffolding in your brain about who American Indian people are. So the thing about books is that books turn into movies, right? And raise your hand if you've seen a Western. Oh, so they're not popular at all, right? No one's seen them. Books turn into movies. Ideas turn into books. Books turn into movies. And so then after the rise of the things like the Nickelodeon and stuff. And a Nickelodeon was a little bit different because a lot of times those, those early movies, they were silent. So all of the, whoever the hero was and whoever the villain was, was really demonstrated by the bad action that they did, right? So very common in Westerns is these different portrayals of American Indian people. So we have the non-native savior or the hero so this idea of an outside entity having to come in and rescue everybody, right? I always tell my students, though, that I don't think that if American Indian people needed to be rescued all the time, if they didn't have the wherewithal or the ancestral knowledge to take care of themselves, we wouldn't have survived for thousands of years. So we have the non-native savior. This idea of an Indian maiden or an Indian princess is very common a lot of times these women are very sexualized in film. Um, and also the, the whole premise of the Indian princess is a European construct because what was happening is they were coming during colonization, they were coming from a monarchy system. So when they were coming in contact with different tribes and understanding certain people in charge in their brain scaffolding where they came from, 
that meant that their whole family was royalty. We have the noble savage, and that's um, usually the non-native savior's companion, very stoic, a lot of times really can't demonstrate a lot of emotion, and how that makes them other is because I know that I'm human, and I know that I love to laugh. That's a very human thing. But when you watch films like this, or you read these books with one-dimensional characters, it's really hard to identify with those individuals because they keep exuding characteristics that we as people, as humans, can't really identify with. We have the mystical medicine man, which is very common. So this concept that American Indian people can perform feats of magic. We have the bloodthirsty savage, very common in film, especially in films that are, are um, juxtaposing themselves. So we have the hero, so we have to have the villain. The idea of native people just killing to kill. And then we also have the foolish savage or the simple savage. So this is, I'll use Dances with Wolves. Uh, raise your hand. I was going to say, raise your hand if you've okay. seen Dances with Wolves. We're not knocking Dances with Wolves, but when we were thinking about which film we wanted to talk about, we just wanted to reference one that a lot of folks have seen. And we can find all of these stereotypes in Dances with Wolves. And the thing about Westerns, sometimes we're faced with as teachers, when we're talking about with our students, people are like, well, Westerns aren't really made anymore. They are. Um, and even old style Westerns are still produced and viewed. So if we think about um, our children being at home and they're choosing, maybe they don't pay for cable, so they have the free channels. And one of our free channels is Grit TV here in Great Falls. And Grit TV plays Westerns all day long. And if you're a kid at home and you're choosing what to watch, you're probably gonna choose to watch the movie channel or Grit TV over watching like the Montana legislators, right? The Senate Judiciary yeah. Committee. Something a little bit more interesting for you and your age level. So kids are actually still exposed to this and adults are still exposed to this. We all remember the movies we've seen when we were younger and it has become something that is shared with families. You know, grandpas share this with their grandsons, for example. So Dances with Wolves demonstrates all of these uh, stereotypes. So we have the non-native savior, which is John Dunbar, um, the lieutenant, and he comes out west as a reward for his heroism. Um, and you see throughout the film, the more time he spends with the native people, the more aspects of civilization are being pulled away from him. So he comes fully dressed, fully in uniform, um, clean shaven, very much military style. Um, and as he's out there more and more, those pieces and aspects start to be pulled away because we've all heard the phrase going native, right? He's spending more time with these quote unquote uncivilized people and those aspects of his civilization start to come away. We have the Indian maiden or the Indian princess. In this case, is um, played by a non-native person. Um, in the storyline, she is taken in by the Sioux tribe at a young age and considered a part of the tribe. Um, but she needs saving and usually has a romantic connection to the non-native savior. In this particular film, they are of the same race. And at the end, they end up together. It's very common in Westerns where that sexualized, very sought after American Indian woman usually dies. They don't a lot of times end up together. This idea that natives also are willing to give their lives for the hero, which also makes them more expendable, right? The more times that you see them die, it kind of desensitizes the audience to things happening. Mm -hmm. We have Kicking Bird played by Graham Greene. Graham Greene is one of the um, favorite native actors in Hollywood. He is in a lot of movies um, and he plays the noble savage. And so he is a companion, becomes friends with the non-native savior um, and is very in inquisitive and op observant to things around him, very no noble and stoic. Um, we have the bloodthirsty savage played by the Pawnee tribe in um, this instance that kill for the sake of killing, kind of angry and bloodthirsty all of the time. We see that in Westerns a lot. Yeah, they seem to roam the prairie throughout the entire film. It's disconnecting, it's othering people different from me because again, like Miranda was saying, the bloodthirsty just killing to kill, but also we don't get to see them with their families. We don't get to see their emotions, maybe why they're upset, maybe they're defending something, right? But the angrier and the naughtier they are in a, in a film, the easier it is when they die at the end, right? And that's in any film. The easier or the, the more misbehaved that the villain is, 
the easier it is towards the end when we get to see them die, right? But again, that desens desensitizing. Um, we have the foolish savage, often played by women and children. In this case, is played by um, Smiles a lot. And Smiles a lot needs saving, right? Uh, he's charged by a bison at one point and just stands there. I think, as Jordan was saying, American Indian people know and have survived for tens of thousands of years with knowing that if a bison is charging me, standing there in its way, maybe not the best action. Scooch over a bit. <laughs> Um, and then lastly over here, played by Ten Bears, we have the mystic uh, kind of shaman or the magical uh, medicine man. And while we know that shaman and medicine man are true and realistic parts of many tribes, um, this representation of this like magical connection to the spirit world or this magical ability to know things really devalues the inherent traditional knowledge that tribes have acquired over thousands of years. Also, as Miranda was saying, you know, we think, well, there's not a lot of exposure to Westerns. Yes and no, because we have grit TV, but that doesn't mean that our children have to watch Western to get this scaffolding or this idea of American Indian people in their head. So here we have Pocahontas and that scaffolding, unfortunately, is beginning at an earlier age, right? She is sexualized in a couple of different ways. So she, first of all, is not civilized. <laughs> she goes uh, without shoes the entire film. That doesn't make any sense. Again, American Indian people didn't survive for thousands of years without the development of shoes, right? But she's often seen throughout this film running through the forest. Hey, Dugan. Hi. He's in charge of us. <laughs> um, She's often seen throughout the film just running through the forest barefoot. She has a very unnecessary, very high slit up the side of her, of her dress. And then also it's very form-fitted, which really accentuates the top part of her chest. What we also know about Pocahontas is that she was probably about 10 or 11 years old in actuality. But in this film, she is featured as a much more maturely developed woman. She can also she also exhibits those those same characteristics of mystical or magical. She can talk to all of the animals throughout the film, and then at one point in the film, she even jumps off a waterfall and and is seemingly able to fly. Impressive skills. And I never learned how to fly. <laughs> I'm upset. So um, we're going to run through a couple of images. Um, and they have no identifying markers. They're just images. And I want you to self-reflect. This isn't a test um, or a quiz that you have to answer out loud. But I just want you to self-reflect when we go through these images whether or not you believe that image is native made, meaning in, um, made by an indigenous artist, or native inspired, made by a non-native artist using native imagery, perhaps. So our first one looks like this. So again, you're just self-reflecting what you think, looking at your contextual clues, um, any imagery that you see and what that might tell you. Okay, then we'll go to number two. Again, just self-reflecting on your idea of whether or not you believe this is native made or native inspired. Number three. Probably maybe imagery you've seen before. That's okay, don't tell. <laughs> Number four. And number five. Okay, so I want you to reflect what you thought was native made, native inspired. We're gonna go through them. I'm gonna tell you the answers. Um, but what I want to share about, and this will be a larger part of our conversation as we go through um, some other artists and some other work in the gallery out here, is that 
non-native artists using native imagery is not inherently bad. That does not make the artwork bad in and of itself. It's definitely situational, and we'll definitely talk about the context of um, appropriation and, and how that works. So this first one um, is called Ghost Bear. This is native inspired. This is by Kirby Sattler, pretty uh, kind of well known in the Western community. Number two, this is called um, Loch Ness Monster. This is actually, this is native made. This is actually one of Frank Buffalo Hyde's works. He's the artist we're going to be looking at downstairs. This is vastly different from the set of work we're gonna see downstairs, um, but a commentary on the mystical and the magical, which is an interesting piece of work. Come on in. Sorry. No, you're fine, come on in. I got lost. That's okay. Um, number three, this is Native inspired. So this is called Dawning Voice by R.S. Riddick. Kind of a common, Sorry. no, you're fine, kind of a common uh, landscape style that you might see um, in the Western art world. Um, number four, this is also native inspired. This is called Lakota Leader, um, and it is by Jason Rich. And then lastly, we have Native Maid, and this is called Where's Grandpa? And it is by Marcus Cadman. I love the layering in the background of the bingo cards on this one. It's one of my favorite pieces. Um, so as you reflected on that, and you kind of were making your guesses as you were going, whether or not you were correct, um, I just want you to kind of reflect and think, if I was wrong in any of my guesses, why did I believe that that piece of art was made either by a native artist or not made by a native artist. How did, how did I come to that conclusion? What kind of imagery was I seeing that made me think that about that piece of work? So every individual has two senses of self. They have the sense of self that they know to be true, but then there's always an outsider perspective. So we have the subjective and objective. So subjective, is told a story told with emotion where you insert your own biases or your own ideas your own opinions and so it would be for an example if it was raining outside you would acknowledge that it's raining but you would say something like i love the rain objectively looking is only reporting facts with no individual em emotion so you would just look outside and say it's raining that's facts only what charlie russell did and he did it really well, is obviously the majority of his work was focused on American Indian people, but what he did so well about that was he wasn't just painting pictures of subjects. He spent a lot of time with a lot of different tribes, and he really got to understand the facts, and you can see it in his descriptions of his work. Every single, every single one of his pieces tells you exactly what's going on because he made sure that he was reporting facts only and he wanted to be as descriptive as possible. He wanted to get every single detail correct. An issue with that though is because Charlie Russell and other artists like him became so popular, then you kind of have a trickle down effect of other artists looking at that, looking at those pieces and saying, well, I can paint things similar, right? And then that's an unfortunate consequence of that is that they start to inherently believe and it's shown through their work that again, all natives look the same, they all have these same traditions, this is what goes on in all native communities. It's also very indicative of um, what we believe as a society, especially people who are not exposed to contemporary American Indian people, as to what Native Americans look like. So when Jordan asked you that question at the beginning, what imagery comes to mind when you hear the phrase Native American, you're, um, through no fault of your own, it's, it's mostly what you're exposed to and the bias that you've been exposed to, you're often going to think of imagery that includes feathers and regalia and that kind of historical um, aspect of American Indian people. And so it's no wonder when we're faced with talking about contemporary Native American issues, there are large groups of people that, that believe that Native American people no longer exist because they're only exposed to this imagery from a historical context. 
So Kirby Sattler is an example of ne not necessarily doing their due diligence in making sure that their work, which might be perceived as accurate or historical, um, is in fact accurate or historical. Um, Kir Kirby Sattler has been kind of o openly criticized for um, his work being pretty stereotypical. Um, a lot of his work, we'll get to that in a second. I'll read this and then I'll, I'll say that next thing so we can go to the next slide. Um, in his artist statement and, and times he's talked about his work because he's been heavily criticized, he speaks that um, his work is leaving it open into interpretation to the audience and that he wants to satisfy the se their sensibilities of the subject without having to adhere to historical accuracy. And as an artist, he has every right to make art however he wants, correct? Um, but the consequences of that is that not everyone is an avid museum goer. Not everyone is going to read his artist statement. Not everyone is going to do any research into his work. And so then what we're left with is this visual image. And so he's openly taking images he's seen from different tribes and mashing them together and even taking things that are not accurate, things from his imagination and mashing them together in paintings. And so we get something like this. Um, when you Google search his name, go ahead, this is the kind of images that comes up of his work. And so I think what you can gather from looking at um, this kind of snapshot of some of his work is that we're seeing a lot of portraiture that fits that noble um, style that we were talking about, that stereotype of this no noble, stoic, kind of sitting proud, um, full regalia or combinations of regalia, um, and this imagery being posed this way. But there's consequences in this, because if you, someone's not um, even even if you were to just read the title, right? We get titles when we're looking at work. You might not go for the artist statement and you might not get to do any research, but you might have a title. And even his titles are a little bit misleading. And so, go ahead. So when his work is then appropriated in and of itself into another format, then you're seeing that work being um, shown to a larger audience as potentially true. So we get his painting called I Am Crow, which even if you just were to read the title, you would assume that that means that this is supposed to be of a crow person. Um, it's not. I can tell you that these, these aren't accurate things to, this, to that tribe. Um, but this image is then a reference photo for this movie. So the newest version of Tonto and Lone Ranger, where Donnie, Johnny Depp plays Tonto, an already controversial character because of its stereotyping. You know, Tonto is um, submissive to the Lone Ranger. He's um, not very well developed character-wise, pretty flat, speaks broken English, which is a, a common movie format to demonstrate intelligence, um, and just generally not portrayed as a very smart individual. And so while this character was already controversial, Johnny Depp is famous for talking about how he really wants to give this character more depth and do, a better, do better justice to this um, character. And so when they take imagery like this and use it as a reference photo for this work, um, it's very possible that people are going to hear how much he wants to do this character justice and not know where this um, imagery, this face paint, or this work comes from. Right? So there's definite consequences to, um, while he has his right as an artist to make whatever kind of art he wants, there's consequences to um, putting artwork out there in a style that is very realistic looking um, and kind of alludes to accuracy. I think it's also interesting to note that in this image, um, because he often portrays native people, as we were talking about earlier, with this like magical connection to animals and the spirit world and earth. Um, in this I am crow, there's crows uh, flying all around, and this crow is flying behind him, very close to him, um, but was interpreted as part of the headpiece in the um, movie, which I did think is a little bit funny. And also it's important to know, similar to that Google search that we did at the beginning of this presentation with Native Americans, 
is those are real images, but also in the late 1800s through the early 1900s, there was this idea or I guess this notion of a dying, disappearing race. So there was a real push on the part of photographers to come and take photos or portraits of American Indians before they were gone, before they weren't around anymore. And so a lot of those portraits that we see are really staged. These photographers told American Indian people, they told tribal members, put on all of your stuff. So then again, there's this idea that American Indian people were wearing pieces or headdresses all of the time when we know that actually that type of regalia is just reserved for certain ceremonies or a certain time and place. That they weren't walking around looking like that all of the time. So it's really important to note that those, those images that we even see from back then are, were very, very staged images because the photographers wanted to capture what they believed wasn't going to be around anymore. Ha. One um, thing I want to say before you go to the last slide is, um, like I said earlier, non-Native artists using Native American imagery isn't inherently bad. And where this conversation is going to take us when we go into the gallery is to see two non-Native artists who are taking imagery, who are taking the concepts and conversations that we've just been having and questioning that. They're taking this popularized imagery, they're manipulating it, reformatting it, stripping it down, and representing it to the audience. They're representing it to us to analyze our relationship with these images and our visual understanding of the American West. And so that will be where our conversation moves. So when this was solidified about a month and a half ago that we were gonna do this, um, I, we were very excited and we did a lot of research. And then last week I texted my grandma, I texted my mom's mom and I said, guess what I'm gonna do? I get to go to the museum, she loves art, and, I told, and she loves the Charlie Russell, and I was explaining it to her, I said, I'm, I'm giving a lecture on Andy Warhol. And she said, why are you doing it? And I was like, trust me, no one's more surprised than me. I said, the, the, particular, the particular pieces that we will be talking about is called his Cowboys and Indians series. And she said, I've never even heard of that. I didn't know that Andy Warhol had anything to do with that. And I said, Google image search, Andy Warhol, Cowboys and Indians. And this was the text that I got back. O-M-G. Yes. <laughs> he should have been better known for this art than his stupid soup cans. <laughs> And the reason that I included this, not that I thought I was going to be accompanied by a lot of grandmothers, but the reason that I included this was because, um, and it just might be her perspective or her frame of reference, but it was very interesting to me that she, a lover of art, didn't even know that there was an Andy Warhol series concerning cowboys and Indians which is really important for our conversation tonight because that was Andy Warhol's whole point. He continually questioned what makes a hero, what makes a villain, what makes something popular, what makes something known, right? And so it was just very interesting to me that this is the conversation that we're having and maybe she's not the only person that doesn't even know that things like this exist, right? They're not even thinking of Andy Warhol having anything to do with American Indian people. They're thinking of, of Andy Warhol painting Michael Jackson in different colors, right? All right, so with that, we thank you for listening to us talk to you, and we're gonna start the exhibit now. All right. <laughs> <laughs>